So, um, thank you, Nathan. Um, our final perspective in the set will be from uh, Hubert Fitzpatrick. Hubert is uh, Director of Housing, Planning and Development at the Construction Industry Federation. Uh, he's responsible for a range of policy functions there, uh, including finance, uh, banking matters, taxation and budgetary policy, uh, including housing and development, obviously, on the, the theme today. Uh, and has also been uh, heavily involved in the registration process for the construction industry register, known as SIRI. Uh, is a director of uh, also of the Irish House Builders Association, director of the Federation's uh, Eastern Region. So I'll ask you but to give the, the final perspective in this set. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. And much of what I'm going to say, I, I broadly agree with, with everything that Marion and Ned stated at first, was with, with exception of one key issue. And, uh, Ned made reference to the fact that he supported the restoration of 20% requirement under Part 5. And uh, in, a, in, a, in an environment when in many cases the cost of building is higher than the market value of the completed product, the restoration of 20% requirement under Part 5 simply is not sustainable and can't be borne by the industry. We certainly welcome the change to 10% and uh, we have had alternative views that even 10% is difficult to manage in, in, in many parts of, parts of the country. But to start off, is, is Ireland alone with the current problem it has? It's not. Um, in England, our closest neighbour, there's 312,000 units required annually for the next five years, and they're delivering about 155,000 units. And in Ireland, uh, just on an average basis, up to 2020, there's about 25,000 units required, and about 12,600 were delivered in 2015. Well, what was the real level of building activity in 2015? I would say that it was closer to eight or 9,000 units max, because many units that were completed in 2015 were actually mothballed, you know, some of them were mothballed from previous years that they would have started perhaps in 2006, 2007, or 2008, and never finished. And uh, the completion figures are measured by ESB connections. So many units might have had a roof on and uh, be, be weathered, and because they were finally completed and, and uh, you know connected to the electricity supply, that referred to a completion. So the real level of building activity that took place in 2015 would be significantly less than 12,600 units. The UK has responded to its problems, and it has three principal initiatives. It is an affordable housing initiative. It's a help to buy initiative, which is launched in 2013, and under the help to buy. Um, 62,000 sales to date have been supported by that scheme and one third of all the sales um, for major house builders have been supported under that scheme. And I'm now introducing another scheme, a starter home scheme, which is pr primarily going to compete maybe with the help to buy scheme. But they're recognising that they have a major difficulty in, the, in, in England and they're, they're bringing forward solutions to help people get, get, get on the property ladder. 80% of all have to buy deals have been taken up in the UK have been taken up by first time buyers. Uh, uh, and say, and help to buy scheme and starter home schemes, they're competing for, for the same market. But help to buy means that, you know, state in effect takes a 20% equity in the house, the purchaser takes on 80%, and over the next number of years the purchaser can then go back and purchase out their interest in the overall scheme. And it is an initiative that we as an industry have supported to government and we'd like to see some action on but I'll touch upon that later, later on in the presentation. What have, we, what have we in Ireland today? Well, I would call it as a, as a broken market. Uh, you know, if we look at the level of house building activity, you know, the required units in urban areas, I'm excluding rural parts of the country. This was a study that was carried out by the housing agency um, and they said that in 20, 2016, for instance, there's 17,100 units required in urban areas. Uh, 2017, 19,428, 20,900. But if we look at the activity in 2015, for instance, there's only about 6,600 units built uh, that were of scheme units, that were more than one half units. I mean, 40 to 50 percent of the units that have been built in the country today have been one off units which are not dealing with the other major demand we have in, in, in the urban areas. Um, 
The number of units commenced, 2014, 7,700 units commenced, 2015, 8,093. So when you look at the completion levels of maybe 12,000 12, units versus the commencement activity, that is broadly reflective of the number of units that were started in earlier years that are now just being completed. So the risk factor is that you could actually see completion activity fall in the next year or two unless, some, unless something happens in order to address the current problem we have with it, with it within the market. So Ireland is no longer one housing market, but it's here's a contrasting markets. I mean, the activity is recovering in Dublin and the Greater Dublin area in the cities in Cork and start to recover, recover in Galway. But uh, there are many, many parts of the country where literally if you can buy a house for 60-70% of what the construction costs would be. And until that issue is adequately resolved, you will have no increased level of house building activity taking place in these areas. So something has to happen. Either costs must be cut or prices must increase. Um, uncertainty, there is uncertainty and difficulties for purchasers. Uh, obtaining adequate mortgage approval. And this is what Marion has, certain, has, has certainly elaborated on in, in our presentation. And we're talking about the central bank macro potential policy here. Um, development finance, that's expensive and difficult to secure. Um, many builders do not have equity on their own balance sheet at this juncture. And they must actually purchase in that equity uh, in order to name them build. Uh, banks will generally fund up to 60% development finance. The remaining funding has to, be, has to be raised by a form of mezzanine funding or purchasing of equity. And in many cases, the cost of that funding can be 10, 12, 14 uh, percent, which, which actually makes building extre extremely difficult in these areas. Ready to go development land with service and planning. While plenty of land is zoned, when one looks closely at the land, a lot of it is not serviced and a lot of it is not ready to go. We have had uh, the public capital program has been cut significantly during the downturn. Uh, we do require water or waste water services to be laid onto that land. There's still an access requirement for roads. But uh, if you look at uh, certain areas, up to 50% of the land is not capable of being developed in the short to medium term until significant infrastructure is provided. Um, small or traditional house builders are finding it difficult to compete to be, to compete to purchase land and secure funding. A lot of the land sales that have taken place over the last year or two have been via major loan sales and it's only uh, large funding bodies were able to come in and buy those loans and then subsequently deal de de with particular land. Uh, individuals who want to buy land who hasn't got planning, there's no funding available for that. So clearly anybody buying land must have equity, they must be able to take the risk. Planning is, is land requiring planning permission is not being funded by the banks at this juncture. It has to be funded by equity. And that's a risk that the banks are not prepared to bear at the current time. I've referred to the fact that replacement cost is higher uh, than market values in, in some areas. And until that balance is, 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 is addressed, you will have little to no new house building taking place in those areas. Do we reduce cost? or increased prices. Um, we look at a €300,000 house. That is actually €264,000 plus that of €35,500. There's zero rate of that applicable in the UK. And we've significant incentives for first-time buyers in the UK. Uh, development levies can vary from maybe €10,000 in some areas to uh, in an extreme case, there are up to 60,000 euros in an area in, 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 in Dublin. Which, and if you have development levies of, of, that, of that scale, you might as well not have the land zoned because nothing is going to take place in those areas until that issue is actually addressed. Part 5, 10% of land requirement is required for Part 5. We would say, why as a first-time buyer who's buying their own, trying to buy, buy their own house in an area, have in fact to contribute to Part 5? Because it has to be borne by somebody. It has to be borne. The costs of complying with Part 5 have to, has to be added on to the house price. And that is a price that a first time buyer has to pay. The overall tax take from new houses is 36%. When you take that 
development levies and all the other related taxes that are, that, that are applicable on, on housing is 36% and that was affirmed by Grant Thornton in the study that they did for us last year when we made the submission to, to the Department of Finance. Question of, 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 of Section 48 development levies. Fine. Section 48 development levies are applicable for general infrastructure to be provided within the local authority area. In many, most, most often very remote from the development site in question. They were introduced at a time when we did no property tax. We now have local authority property, we now have property tax. So, you know, should the Section 48 levies be abolished for new housing uh, and that the property tax in effect fund the development that's, that was required to fund by the, by, by the, development, by the development levies? Just a table, I'm not sure if you, if you can read here, I set out on the, uh, the deposit and loan to income requirements in respect of particular prices of houses. And if one is uh, dealing with a purchase price of a house of 250,000 euros, in that situation, the deposit required is 28,000. Uh, the repayments uh, over 25 years would be 1,135 euros. Uh, and the combined income required to buy that are 63,000 63, euros. If you had up to 350,000 euro house, 48,000 of a deposit requirement, uh, and the income, the combined annual income required to get that loan would be 86,000 euros. It's very, very, very high, and that's what's causing the difficulty at the moment. People cannot get more of just uh, having regard to the loan to income requirement or indeed the deposit requirements. And because people cannot get loans and there's no certainty of it, the industry can't respond. Because the industry is only able to build houses when it knows that the purchases are out there and they have to secure mortgage approval. And people go out now and they can look at a show house. If they like a show house, they can put down a book and deposit to buy, it, to buy a house on it. But they must prove that they have the capacity to borrow and that there's loan approval in place. And if they can't get loan approval, the developer, the house builder, cannot get his development finance. So you're caught in a cash 22 situation and it's an issue that has to, has to, be, has to be addressed. The minimum uh, number of units required, with, with an undersupply of 4,000 units in 2014, the new supply requirement in 2015 was 16,000. We saw there was about 12,000 units provided. Uh, 2016 new supply requirement is 20,000 20, units. We'd be lucky if we've 12,000 units provided this year. So, you know, on an overall basis, we can see the shortfall in housing supply continue, continue to develop, which has caused major problems. At the same time, we've, we're coming out of a, a prolonged recession, but our population has continued to grow, and we've had continuous population growth in Ireland for the past, 20, past 25 year, years. We've had no house building taking place for a number of years, so clearly that has, that has to be addressed. We had 1.65 million households in the state in 2011. Uh, that grew by 630,000 from 1991. Um, so household growth continued despite the recession and con that contributed to a significant reduction in the oversupply of housing that pertained. Ireland's household size is declining steadily. Uh, it still is significantly higher than the, the EU average size. But because it's declining, that's contributing to an incre increased demand for housing. Marion had, had a slide very, very similar to this. You can see our house completion levels, uh, how the, the 90,000 90, units there in, uh, in 2007, 2007, and how it has fallen back, where we're starting to increase at, increase at, the, at the current time. Um, house completions compared to uh, 2006, you can see where Ireland was totally out of field to what had happened uh, th throughout the rest of Europe. But the problem was that the houses were built in the wrong locations. And we don't have, we didn't have significant oversupply in any of the cities. Uh, the supply was in the areas where there was no, where there was no real demand. Vacancy rates were significantly lower in the greater Dublin area according to the 2011 census. You can see that it was like uh, Dublin, Mead, Dublin, Wicklow and Kildare, uh, the lowest vacancy rates and the highest vacancy rates were in Leitrim, Longford, Roscommon and Cavan, all counties which I think benefit from the rural renewal tax incentives and we can all look back and see where, where mistakes were, were, were made in the past. 
this is a this is taken from the DAFT report, which seeks to compare the cost of renting to the cost of buying. And if we look at Galway, for instance, if you, you, you a mortgage, to, to, you know, for uh, one bed apartment uh, would be 251 euros per month. The cost of renting would be 444 euros a month. You have similar problem, 493 euros per month to, uh, to rent a two bed house and a mortgage would be 293 euros a month. So it's actually more expensive now in many parts of the country to rent than to buy. And this is referring back then to our central bank macro credential policy. In many cases where people are renting, it's impossible for them to save a deposit. Uh, and in fact, if they're able to buy, they would be better off because they would have more, more money in the pocket. But that's not, that's not uh, addressed whatever in the central bank requirements. And it's an issue that we think should, should be addressed. What has been the government response to date? Well, they've introduced new, new apartment guidelines to reduce construction costs. Uh, primarily in, in, in the cities. Um, it has reduced the number of cores that, cores that can be required uh, and reduced the requirement for a dual aspect and that's made provision for studios in purpose built schemes. We had a situation that some uh, city councils increased the standards for apartments over and above the DOE standards and that resulted in driving the costs up that the work wasn't affordable to build them. So I would hope that the guidelines introduced by government will reduce construction costs somewhat. It's part of a solution, but not the total solution. It has introduced a waiver scheme of Section 48 development levies for schemes of greater than 50 units in Dublin or Cork, where sales prices are less than €250,000 in Cork or less than €300,000 in Dublin. But it's not adequate because uh, in both Cork and Dublin, it's very difficult to secure a house at less than those prices. Uh, and I think it's quite restrictive in terms of 50, 50 units. And I think they should introduce um, a further waiver Section 48 development levies for a period of time in order to make building affordable and to incre increase supply going forward. Um, schemes have been introduced where money is, money is available, development funding is available for housing, activate capital. Uh, has been uh, established by, uh, in conjunction with the NTMA and KKR, uh, but the funding cost of its, cap, its development finance is 10% plus about 2% of sales. It's still very, very expensive. Uh, you know, the government will state that the price that they launched the funding at must be competitive with, uh, with other funders and it cannot confer any unfair competitive advantage to activate capital over and above other funders. But it's like that cost of funding is difficult and, and uh, it, it means that development in many cases still is not, is not viable. We have the Ireland Strategic Investment Fund in place. That is a fund of 7.4 billion and part of that fund is to fund real estate, which is housing, social housing investment, commercial real estate and so on. But it will fund uh, housing rates enabling infrastructure in large-scale priority development areas in order to try to kick-start funding. But its projects will be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis and they want to look at various funding models, how they can be innovative to make that available. But, you know, it's still for significant large schemes, uh, innovative solutions, it's not going to help with the ordinary small-scale scheme that's required in many, part, many parts of the country. What options are open for consideration? We would say that while we welcome the central bank policy and it certainly has a role to play in you know, protecting the banks and, in, and ensuring that we, we do not repeat the mistakes of the past, I do believe that the policy needs, needs tweaking. Uh, the loan to income ratio of 3.5 3 we feel is too restrictive. Uh, a rate of 4.5 applies in the UK and um, perhaps it should be increased to, increased to 4.5. The deposit requirement. Uh, the threshold is 10% up to €220,000 and 20% above that. Uh, certainly if you're buying in some of the city areas, the 220, you can't get a first time buyer house for €220,000 and perhaps that should be increased to €280,000 to €300,000 and maybe apply the 20% requirement for deposit thereafter. Section 48 development levies, I've referred to that already. 
we think that the property tax is in place now that should replace the Section 48 development levies. The VAT rate at 13.5%, no, we've zero rate in the UK, uh, with special 9% uh, rate introduced uh, in respect of the tourism sector, which was hailed as a great success. Uh, we have sought that that rate should be introduced for residential building for a period of two years and just try to stimulate building activity, try to make it more afford affordable to build in many areas. Uh, and it would actually have a significant difference in, term in terms of overall build, build costs. Um, first time buyer incentives, uh, help to buy scheme, you could restrict it to people who are joint incomes are less than 60,000 euros. Introduce it for a couple of years. And if you do that, it's actually going to curtail the growth of social housing waiting lists that Ned talked about. And we believe that that would be significantly cheaper for the, for the state uh, as opposed to do nothing. Uh, the people have a difficulty putting together the deposit and that is going to be a problem for years to come. And we suggested why not have an incentivised savings scheme, particularly for first time buyers who are going to buy their first home and run it on a trial basis for a couple of years. Uh, and that would actually assist people in putting the deposit together. If it transpires that they don't spend it on purchasing a principal private residence for themselves, it should then be subject to tax. But it would be an incentive to, to help the first-time buyer address their own problems. Conclusion. A balance must be achieved between construction costs, market value and affordability. And clearly it's out of picture at the moment. There are places in the country where you can still buy a three-bedroom semi-detached house for €110,000 and less in some cases. You're not going to have building taking place when that market prevails. Um, at the same time, you have to ensure it's affordable. You have to ensure that people can get an adequate mortgage and that they can afford it. Uh, and we must have a situation where market value uh, actually does give a builder a margin on construction costs in that he can fund his risk. Because no bank or funder will advance money to a developer in order to build in an environment of that nature. There must be access to ready to go development sites for smaller builders. And they're not, they don't exist in many parts of the country. Uh, there's a lot of land zoned, but at the same time there's still a lot of land that's not serviced and ready to go. Uh, and banks and funders uh, do not want risk and do not want any planning risk going forward. And they will only be interested in the project when it's really ready to go and all the planning and infrastructure issues have been de-risked out of it. Uh, we need assurances that mortgages are available to purchasers. I went to the launch of a, of a scheme during the past weekend, a new house scheme, and the key issue there for the agents is that the people who want to put a, put a book and deposit down for a house have to be able to produce evidence that they have, that they have their mortgage and that they're able to enter into an unconditional contract to purchase that unit within the next 21 days. And if they don't do that, there's no point in putting a deposit down for, for the house. And then when the builder doesn't get those assurances, he's constrained from going on and building the next phase. Costs are rising due to pressure and skills and labour costs. So, you know, some people would say, reduce the cost of, the, the cost of building the house. What can you reduce? Uh, wages uh, and input costs are, are increasing. Um, so it's also, we did look at the cost of building a house in the UK compared to the Irish costs. And by and large, the hard building costs of a house in the UK and here in Ireland are identical. The only difference in cost is the other add-ons. A lot of it is related to, to the development levies, the financing costs and the VAT. And that accounts for the difference between UK prices and Irish prices. We need to increase output in the right locations and at the right cost, and that's critical. And the difficulty at the moment is that the housing crisis is affecting the country's competitiveness. And a lot of the issues being raised now by FDI companies setting up in our, in our cities is, is there accommodation available for the workforce? Uh, is that posing a problem? And if we end up with a situation where we cannot have adequate, affordable housing accommodation available, for workers and new businesses setting up, we run the risk of losing those businesses. And that is a serious issue from, from, from Ireland as, as a whole. So that's, that's, that's me, Chairman. Happy with that. Thank you.